Hello community. I hope you were impressed by the title, but you know, the truth is it is very easy today. It is one of the simplest and one of the most complicated things I would like to show you. Why this video? I want to show you if you do not have the money to run the fine tuning of GPT systems, or you cannot afford fine tune chat GPT, or you cannot afford fine tune POM 540B or whatever autoregressive large language model you have, there is a way that without spending tons of money, actually you don't have to pay anything, how to get the best results out of your pre-trained LLM. And it, the answer is simple. On the one side, you have to give an intelligent input, but it is something completely different what you might expect. And with this input, you get significant better results back without spending any US dollar at all. So for this, we have to do a little bit of theory. Now, you know, the fine tuning, the word fine tuning, uh, I have about 50 videos about coding fine tuning on bird models, BioBird or DataBird or whatever you want. And then on the other side of the transformer on the decoder stack, so to speak, we have those GPT monsters, GPT-3, BioGPT, JetGPT. And now they also use the term fine tuning. Now, what I would like you to understand, and you are one of not a lot of experts, that fine tuning is not always what it is. With GPT system, we can do prompting. And for example, I will show you with BioGPT, we will do a prefix tuning. Officially, or to be unprecise, everybody, even Microsoft, calls it fine tuning. But I want that you understand if you have to code it, it is not fine tuning. It is something completely different. And I would like to show you how to do it and give you the reason and the explanation why it is. So, GPT 3 or Chat GPT or whatever you want to call it, there's the option of prompting. Now, prompting means pre pending specific instructions and a few examples to the task input and then you are generated the output from those language model which is significant better so the system learns with an intelligent input so gpt3 in particular uses manually designed prompts to adapt its generation from different tasks and this framework has a specific term so when you hear in context learning or icl you know it, it is about prompting, input prompting, prompt engineering, the input to a GPT system. Now, there's a limitation. Since transformer, and we have here now the decoder stack, you know, can only condition on a bounded length context for a GPT-3, it is defined with 2048 tokens in length. So the in-context learning, so this is what I will try with prompting, is unable to fully exploit larger training sets, training sets that are longer than the context windows. So you have a quite hardcore limit on 2048 tokens for GPT-3 for this condition. Therefore, and I showed you in one of my last video that BioGPT was now released by Microsoft on the Hugging Face platform, the model, they um, diverted a little bit and they used a recent development that is called prefix tuning. Now, this is a lightweight alternative, as they themselves call it, to fine tuning for natural language generation. And we are here at autoregressive system. So you have given the beginning of a sentence and you want the next word and the next word to be inserted by the machine. And this, this new methodology was inspired by prompting. So you see, you have the classical fine-tuning task on the bird system, on the decoder, and on the encoder, you get prompting, which was really nice as a new alternative, and the latest state-of-the-art, if you want here, uh, BioGPT, just some weeks ago or days ago, it was published on Hugging Face. You have this prefix tuning, and even Microsoft calls it a fine-tuning approach, but you will see it is not. But what we can learn is we understand the system and we can get results even without applying fine tuning if we have a clever input. So here we go. Whatever we tune, whatever we do, we have to have data. So all these models, whatever there is, 
they are pre-trained on a huge data set, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions of documents. Beautiful. If we do fine tuning, we do it for a specific downstream task. Let's say today our downstream task is question and answer. Beautiful. Now, the first thing that you know, uh, GPT-3 is for years now available. So you have the OpenAI API, fine tune, create, and then everything. And if you read really clearly here, and please copyright information, this conditional generation on OpenAI, you have here paraphrasing, summarization, entity extraction, product description, chatbots, whatever. You can imagine what it is. And they give you guidelines if you pay uh, OpenAI to fine tune the GPT-3 model, for example. They say you have to use certain separators. You have to have an end separator. They are aim at least for 500 examples. And I show you exactly how the examples have to look like. And they tell you, hey, to ensure that the prompt and the completion does not exceed the 2048 tokens, including all separators. So everything, as I just showed you here, we are bound by 2048 tokens here for GPT-3, for example. This is a Example for GPT-3. So please check yourself. I have here um, platform.ai.guide fine tuning prepare your data set. So this is the classical approach. And here I would recommend going to uh, this notebook here. I leave you here. A collab research link fine tune GPT-3 with weights and biases with W and B. This is a really interesting page. Have a look at them. I'm not sponsored by them, not at all, but use the resources that are available. So, and here you see, for example, what is the prompt and the completion structure. We have here the prompt, prompt one, let's say is Livermore, California. And the completion, Livermore is a city in Alameda country, California, in the United States. And beautiful. Next one. Albany Wool and Mills, also known as Western Australia, Western and Wool Mills Limited was a wool mill located in Western Australia. And so you see, you have a prompt and you want a system to complete this prompt with this learned information. So rather easy to understand, beautiful. Now, this was GPT-3. Now let's look at BioGPT. You see here, published in archive uh, January 13. 2023, Microsoft, Microsoft, Microsoft. I had a particular vid video already on this, but what I want to show you, we need data for BioGPT. And I want to show you the data Microsoft used. And this is a public domain data, so it's called public medical Q&A. And this is a biomedical question answering data set. And as I told you, we are today only in the question and answering part to make it easy, understandable. So in this public data set that is available, you can download it, you can play it, you can use it. You have a sample structure. So you have a question, a biomedical question. What is the drug? What is the biochemical structure? What is the molecular structure? How is the drug-drug interaction? Whatever. Then you have an answer. And from the scientific papers, the abstract of a scientific paper, you have additional information that's called a reference or just a context. And then you want, as it's an answering data set, they go for a binary or tertiary answer. Yes, no, maybe. This is what they call the label. So you have question, answer, context, and label in this structure, where the data set is built up in exactly this particular pattern. So. And then you have to know two information, two further information. You have the source sequence and the target sequence. And I will show you both. So PubMed is, of course, the first uh, question and answer data set where they tried reasoning over the biomedical research text, especially the quantitative context. Yes, yes, yes. But why we, or well, Microsoft uses this, it is the largest size of expert, of human expert annotated Yes, no, maybe question in the biomedical domain. So we have here the human input, the human feedback, the human evaluation of this data set. So if you want to have a look, of course, there's a research paper. Please have a look here. You're not going to believe it. Google was involved in this, but of course. And here 
you have now one data set just to show you the structure and we need to understand this to generate better input. So at first you have a question, beautiful. And then you have the context from somewhere an abstract, scientific abstract, they tell you blah, 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 yes, beautiful. And then they have what they call here a long answer. So somewhere in a scientific paper, there's the sentence, our study indicates that the preoperative statin therapy seems to reduce some development of some whatever. So this is the conclusion because you ask, is there something? And they said, yes. And now from this long answer, a human expert came down to a binary answer, yes, no. Oh, test very, yes, no, maybe. So, and this is exactly what you want. But just to tell you, have a look here. The study indicates that the therapy seems, seems to reduce. So I would have gone here with a maybe, but the expert decided to go with yes here in biomedical. So beautiful. So you see, this is the data structure that we will now do the fine tuning on. And as you, when you read the research paper, uh, Microsoft writes the fine tuning for BioGPT for a downstream task. Remember, we are always focused on the downstream task. We have here question answering or a question and answering, whatever you want to call it. Fine tuning here is if you really are correct, we have to tune, we have to code it, is the wrong answer because it's not fine tuning. Let me show you why. So, again, this is the text here from their publication, and you see. They have a source sequence and a target sequence. And now say their methodology from January 2023 here to fine tune BioGPT, Microsoft itself. They say we prepend a description, word, question, context, and answer before the question, context, and answer, and concatenate the string together as the source sequence. So you see here, question, context, beautiful. So they have now a sequence of text the question itself that you want to know. Then in the fine tuning, they provide you now the context from the scientific papers, the summary or the, the whatever particular parts, particular chapters of the publication. This is now that goes into the context and the answer is taken from a publication. Now, for example, the long answer, the answer text, this sentence here. And then you have a target sequence. And you want this target sequence to be structured in a particular logic. So you say the answer, this answer text, to the question, question text, given the specific content, content text here, is, and now comes the binary classification problem if you want, yes. So this is more or less the input data for what Microsoft calls fine-tuning BioGPT, but we now know that it is not a fine-tuning, but that it is a prefix tuning. Because if you read their paper, you come to the paragraph where they say, what is absolutely correct, during the inference run, so after the pre-training, after the fine-tuning, if they have some, in the inference run, we provide the source text, and the prompt as the prefix for the language model to condition on and let the language model generate the target output. So you see this prefix here in our sequence where you have question, context, and answer. All this additional information you feed in your input to your query. This is what they call prefix tuning. And prefix tuning optimizes a task specific prefix that applies to all instances of that particular task. And this is why it is used as an advancement of fine tuning, because we have downstream tasks. And here, with an autoregressive system, we have the beauty that this applies to all instances of the, of the task. It is task specific. So, Prefix tuning can be applied to NLG tasks. So 
If you now code this, this means that the language model parameters remain fixed. And just the prefix parameters of the system become now the only trainable parameters. To give you a rough idea of dimension, if you say the whole model parameter is 100%, I suppose as an idea the prefix parameter is about 0.1%. So you see the amount of training you have to do is significantly smaller, but you get similar results. Now, of course, this prefix tuning was not invented here by Microsoft, but you have the original scientific publication here by Stanford University, prefix tuning, optimizing continuous prompts, the prompt input for generation, for text generation. I have a look here at the archive preprint. I can really recommend this paper. And just to give you an idea between the technical term fine tuning that we apply here and the methodology of prefix tuning that BioGPT by Microsoft was fine tuned on, it is the coding of a prefix tuning. And you see here normally, you have the transformer with its layer and you have the fine tuning and everything is, is in motion, everything will be altered, all the weights will be included and so on for the task of a translation, for the task of a summarization, for the task of table to text or for the task of question and answering. Now, with prefix tuning, as I told you, all those weights of, of the model stay, they are, if you want, frozen. You have just this small vector here in front, this prefix, and this is where <laughs> the encoding, the embedding is gonna happen. So from this publication, optimizes a small, continuous, task-specific vector here. And this is called what they call a prefix. So therefore, prefix tuning, it is a task-specific vector tuning based on your content, of course. Now, if you dive a little bit deeper in this paper, you get an idea, you get a little bit of mathematics that it tells you how does it work with the loss function and trainable parameters and the differences. Uh, not for the moment. I just want to give you the main message is, despite learning 1,000 few times fewer parameters than fine-tuning, the prefix tuning can maintain comparable performance. And this is, if you think about the theory, amazing. 1,000 times fewer parameters of a model and you get the same performance if you just do some different tuning of the model. So this is one of the advances here at end of 2022 beginning of 2023, that also you should take advantage of, because if you have to pay OpenAI for fine tuning and you do this methodology, well, you can calculate the difference. There are a lot of other options coming up now. We see here, November, 2022, ask me anything. AMA is the short acronym. This is a strategy for prompting language model. And it's a very funny, have a look at this paper. They just say, hey, let's, why just come up with one prompt? Let's generate, I don't know, a set of prompts and put all together and try which is the best prompt. So you have so many possibilities to play with these systems. So they collect multiple effective yet imperfect prompts and aggregate them. And this can lead to a highly quality prompting strategy. So if you have no financial limitations, you can try, experiment, whatever you like. So this was more or less here the green part. We learned about fine-tuning, we learned about prompt engineering, and we learned about this new technology that advances on fine-tuning, was inspired by prompt engineering, and is now called prefix tuning of large language model autoregressive models. And now comes the main part of the talk. My goodness, you have new options with this. You can save a lot of money not paying a cloud provider to find you on this on your specific company data, of your domain-specific data, but you can use something more intelligent, and it is called here the chain of thought, or React. And I would like to show you this, that you can apply it and you can save something. So first, chain of thought. 
This is uh, January 10, 2023. Google research, well, coincidence. Um, large language models. So autoregressive models, chat, GPT, whatever comes out of Google in the next days, weeks, months, I have no idea. There is this beautiful chain of thought prompting methodology. Let me show you how it works. If you want to read the theory, the mathematics, I give you the link to the paper, but just to show you what it is. You have normally your standard prompting. You have your model and you say, you type in, hey, this is my question, and you get an answer back by the system. And then you have the next question and you get an answer back, and now this time the answer is wrong. Now they find out if you provide not this information, these three lines, and an answer, and three lines, and an answer, but if you have here, this is the input text now to this question. So you give an example, a complete example, as an input to chat GPT or GPT-3 or whatever you have. You say, hey, Roger has this, 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 how many? And then you also give the answer as an example, and you give the chain of thought, your reasoning, your way, your path of reasoning. And you say, okay, so we start with this, and then we put this, and then it's, this is the result here, first step, and then we do this, and then we alter it, and then we get a result. And given that the answer, the structured answer here, and you have a similar question now here, as the next question you really want to have solved, of course, they have to have some connects here. You can go with some completely crazy here. They have to have some overlapping if you want. You will get an output where the system now follows your, I will not call it reasoning, that is too much, your path of argumentation, your chain of thought, how to come to this result. And this is something beautiful. So you can teach the system, if I have this question, I, I want from you this kind of answer. This is the way how you have to construct this answer for me. And now I have my question. The model really, and this is the beauty of autoregressive systems, comes out and learns this here. Now, there are a huge a lot of questions. How is this possible? Why is this possible? What's the mathematics? How is the configuration of the system? What are the parameters? Forget all about it. Read the paper. Just want to show you what you can achieve, what you can do without paying extra. If you say, but what's the difference? Let's look here just at the yellow and the kind of orange here. And this is the world of mathematics. And you use, yeah, we know we have to use huge systems. So Palm 540 billion parameter system. You have here, if you use Palm, the same system in yellow here, and you have the standard prompting. So you just have, hey, uh, what is, I don't know, three plus five. And the solve rate will be just 18%. Although this model has been trained, I don't know, for weeks, months, centuries, it is, it is really on mathematics. This, this is, the solve rate is, is, is underproportional. Let's call it underproportional. Now, the same system, you don't have to pay for any fine tuning on mathematics. You don't have to pay for any additional modules. You don't have to pay for any solver packages that people sell on the internet. If you just reformulate your input, you can get from 80% solve rate close to 60% just by asking or providing this kind of information as input to the system. So you see, this is something you really should make use of if you interact with chat, GPT, or other systems. And they are able here to have these jumps in performance because you give them a chance to show you, this is my question, this is the answer I expect. And as a, a rule of, as a feeling, I would say, how many question answers you have to provide to really achieve a kind of an optimum. And in my case, now for my text and for my ideas and for my answers, it is about five pairs of Q and A. So I, I write Q1, A1, Q2, uh, A2. So till I have five, and then I have my main question. 
some colleagues tell me I need eight. Okay, so but between let's say between five and eight, if you give five to eight examples, those huge systems with 540 billion parameters, they are able to answer you in the way that you want it. So do not stay with one example, but just as a rough idea, five to eight, and then your question, and you will be amazed by the quality of this answer. So prompting a palm 540B, just eight chain of thoughts, examine a chief state of the art. Yeah, there are different mathematical benchmark, and yes, and so process, even a fine-tuned GPD with a verifier and whatever. So you can do something if you have a clever input. You have to know about this. And you're not going to believe it. Now we have the next level of complexity. What we do now, we take this chain of thought prompting and we combine it with acting. And acting is simply, as I showed you in, in u.com chat and in Perplexity AI, you integrate now online sources like Google Search or Wikipedia or oh yeah, Bing. Bing will be the new, you know what I mean? So you have now this chain of thought prompting with the ability that the system has now here this link to external information. And what is this called? React. Maybe you will hear people talking about React, and this is not about something what you might think of, but this is simply a synergy of reasoning and acting, reasoning and acting in large language models. Uh, Google Research, yeah, well, what a coincidence, and Princeton. And they combine this, and this is the research paper. Please have a look indeed about React, the reasoning and acting in large language model. Just to give you some ideas. So we combine our hopeful abilities for reasoning as chain of thought prompting and acting. And yes, 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 so knowledge base, and I just told you everything. The nice thing here is if we now look also on question and answer, this is the easiest topic you also can verify just seeing the results you see here that you have significant better results the research paper gives you applying react outperforms imitation and reinforcement learning methods and reinforcement learning is a big part of chat gpt by an absolute success rate of 34 percent and 10 percent so these are really chumps that you achieve in the accuracy in the success rate of the system when you prompt a system in this React way. And as I showed you, it is rather easy to implement it. You do not need any code, any specific. You just have to know how to do it. So, yes, 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 text, text, text. Uh, let's have a look at example. So here we go. You have a question. The question here is, aside from Apple Remote, what other devices can control my Apple Remote? Beautiful. Now. If you have a GPT system, you get a standard reply, an iPod, which is, okay, wrong, beautiful. If you then just apply this chain of thought, and you have here this input and to this question, and you get an answer that is has a multitude of answers element, but is also wrong. And then if you take from react only the act only, so you do a search, and this is more or less what you.com would be or perplexity AI would be where I showed you that they have access to Google search or to Microsoft Bing, the search engine. You see here, you have an act one, the search. You have an observation of the agent that is now getting some additional information from its environment. You have an act two, another search. If this is not does not deliver the results you're looking for, you have a second observation. And then somewhere you stop and they give you an answer and the answer is wrong. And now this, the beauty is, of course, if you combine reasoning and acting, so thinking and action together, they give you here this example where I say, thought one, I need to search Apple remote and find a program it was originally designed for to interact with. So you have an action, you start action one, you search for Apple remote on a search engine. You get some, some paragraph back, some, some text back, and then, you have your thought number two, Apple Remote was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you search for a more detailed question. You get the observation back, hey, I could not find this. So say, no problem. If you did not find this, 
we need to search for a new, I don't know, a term, topic, whatever. And now this the act of search happens, the observation comes back, is discontinued, and then you know exactly your sort number four, and this finally is the sort that brings you to the finish and gives you the correct answer. So you see, you have this kind of reasoning action that you present to the system so that the system can learn from this. Think about it as a, it's a, it's a, a, a cookbook, it's a recipe for an LLM, for Jetta, Jet GPT or whatever autoregressive systems you work with. This is the recipe you tell the system in the input prompt. Hey, listen, this is my recipe. Do it. I think this is the easiest way. Yeah, there's decision making. I would not go to decision making. If you want to have an idea how the, 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 the theory behind it is, is simple. They say that within the agent, they augment the agent's action space where they give it now an another dimension or another space in itself, which is the space of language. So an action is now part of the language space, which we will refer to as a sort or a reasoning trace. But this does not affect the external environment, so we have no observation feedback from this. But we have extended our, now think about a vector space, so we have more or less more possibilities. And they say, as yes, the language space is unlimited, yes, 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 and we have a POM 540B, is prompted with few shot in context examples to generate both domain specific action and free form language sorts to ask to, for task solving. And it's nice. It's it's a little bit challenging, yeah. They have some nice results, but I would say have a look at the data yourself. Just to give you an idea, this is what I wanted to show you with the last information from this research paper here. Um, if you have the learning now as a prompt or as a learning at the classical fine tune, they show you here the scaling results for prompting and fine tuning on a specific fine tuning always specific task and the task is question and answering if you use now this react scheme and they have your different models and you see here you have here in blue the standard model in orange you have the chain of sort in green yeah act forget it and then you have here in red the react way and as you can see here the model size this here for example is a 540 billion POM model, and you see, independent of the methodology that you use here, you are about, I don't know, 25%, whatever, uh, that that uh, percentage indicates on success rate or, or normalized success rate or whatever. But you can now, and look here, you can achieve here with the real fine-tuning, of course. I mean, if you really have a huge data set that you can fine-tune the whole system on, you achieve even with the 62 billion POM model, you achieve here, let's have a look at the React, the best result of those four methodologies, but even higher than with the 540 billion model, where you just have the learning methodology in the prompting. Of course, if you have real high quality data, thousands and thousands and thousands of elements of new data, where you can f run a fine tune, of course it is better than when you do just eight examples in your input prompt for a pre-trained LLM. But just to show you, so with fine tuning, if you have the chance to really fine tune a system, if you have the data, the human generated data, wherever you collect your data, fine tune is the way to go, even with React. You see, even you can come down from a 540 billion system just to a just 62 billion size system in Palm, and you get even better results with fine tuning. This was it for here. I don't want to go in further details. Yeah, there are different benchmarks. Have a look at this. It is really interesting. Um, yeah. And now there's something else. And this will be the last part of this talk now today. I want to show you. Now that you have seen that with the structure of your input prompt, the structure of the question, that you do not just have a question, but you provide information before you ask the system so that the system can learn on this little place when you ask something. 
how? How is this possible? Now I showed you that it is possible, but what is the deeper explanation of it? And there is a beautiful paper, Google Research, MIT, Stanford, and they try to come up with an explanation and it's a, a mathematically a little bit challenging, but really interesting paper. Please have a look at this. And it is the question, why is in-context learning in autoregressive systems like large language model possible? What happens? How can you simply by providing some input, some demonstration in the, in the questioning field, and the system learns from this without being fine-tuned in the heavy, old-fashioned way. And the answer they come up with is that there is a system within the system, that the, the hidden layers have, if you want, a self-similar, I will not call it a reasoning structure, a self-similar connectome developed, so that very simple task like regression can be performed also not being exactly fine-tuned for this task, but just given five to six, seven, eight examples. And this is for a theoretical point of view, a fascinating question. But this would now, I think, be a little bit too much for today. Have a look at the paper. It's about 10, 12 pages of mathematics. If you like mathematics, Go for it. I say thank you. I hope you enjoyed it a little bit and I'll see you in my next video.